Ah, welcome. Welcome to this, this virtual spiritual journey to Egypt. Um, I've been to Egypt many times and I have a, a home and a spiritual center in Egypt. And so I want to share the journey with you today. And the first thing I want to do is uh, smudge the area. I've been, the smudge, the, the herbs have been burning for a little while. And so clearing, clearing the air and clearing the space. And I will start with calling the directions. Um, the directions that I call are a little different from some you may have seen. They, part, of, part of it comes out of my, my um, ancestral background from the Native American side of me, but also from the Celtic line. And so I use some, some terms that are not always used in the directions. And with those, I typically call in um, the guides or the gods and goddesses from, from various uh, places. So we'll see who um, comes through to call in today as we do this. So let me, um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, so for the recording, I'll, I'll start out with myself showing and then we can uh, join together in a few minutes. If you are not muted, please mute yourself just so we won't get any background noise coming through as we do this. So I start in the center. And I say thank you to the divine light. Thank you to the oneness. Thank you to the creator and the creation of us being here on planet Earth. And I turn to the east. The east is the direction of sunlight, of sunrise, and is the direction of illumination. Ah, and in the east is Amun-Ra and his counterpart Mut, who came to create the earth, create the waters, create all around us. And in the east sits Tefnut awaiting her daughter Nut who each morning rises in the east and gives birth to the sun to eliminate our path for the day. We say thank you. The south is the direction of love and laughter and music and rhythm and dance. And up rises the beautiful Egyptian goddesses Basset and Hathor. Hathor, the goddess of love, reminds us to dance through the journey of life, to live in love and laughter, and to smile. And so smile as you look to the south. We make a quarter turn to the right as we move to the west. Ah, the west is the direction of the setting sun, where Newt moves into the west to receive the sun, to swallow it, and hold it in gestation in her body until the next sunrise. And there in the west is also Sekhmet, the dark goddess who calls us into introspection to come and sit in the darkness with the ancestors who teach us their knowledge that we have forgotten from the ancient past. And we say thank you. And I turn to the north. Mm. Newt rises from the west and flies across the sky, meeting up with Tehute and Kansul, the gods of the moon. And they reach the north where Ma'at the goddess of justice and balance, rise to meet us. She calls us to take our knowledge from the West and transmute it into wisdom consciousness of the North. And as we step into wisdom consciousness, she calls us to stand up as warriors of the heart. And we say thank you. And we come full circle. 
back to the center. And I reach to the stars, to the moon, to the sun, to the Milky Way, and say thank you for your guidance and reaching down to Mother Earth and Mother Water. We say thank you for holding us and carrying us through this journey today. And I end with words from many traditions. Aho, Ashi, Amen. Blessed be, Alhamdulillah. And so it is. Mm, so I set aside my rattle. This is a Hattar rattle. Hattar is uh, the goddess of love. She's known as the cow goddess because the cow is nurturing and life-giving. And this is, um, this is a sistrum that the priestesses of Hattar would have used in the, uh, in the temple during their ceremonies. So I, I welcome you. I welcome each of you. I hear... Um, the tones of people coming in. Thank you for being here today. I'm very, very appreciative for each of you being here. Um, I have a, a couple of quotes I want to start with today, which I think are very appropriate. One is from Nikola Tesla. <laughs> and he said many, many years ago, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And that's what we're talking about today. The frequency, the energy, the vibration of Egypt. And I have one other quote that comes from one of our Egyptian guides named Majub. Majub said, being in Egypt inside the temples will help the people to get into their heart, help them see the light, which is the leader of our life transmission of the wisdom, transmission to touch our hearts, unusual feeling in Egypt. He said that to me during a, um, I, I had a summit in 2020 and I interviewed him about the chakra system in Egypt and that was one of the uh, things that he said to me. So Egypt calls each one of us to awaken our memory and help to activate the original power that was there. The ancients knew how to connect the divine wisdom and the healing power. And the sacred sites of Egypt contain echoes of that memory. They were originally created as powerful energy networks to activate healing and intuition, our spiritual connection and many more things. And as you'll see in the pictures in this presentation, as you see them, open your hearts and your minds and your emotions to experience the, um, the energetic connection that comes from even the photographs. But don't just stop there with feeling the energy. Just feeling the energy is part of the journey. The other aspect is to allow that divine awakening to flow through us, to help us uplift the consciousness of the collective humanity as we invite the flow to reawaken the ascension energy in the temples and the pyramids. So I invite you now to join me on this, this visual journey. So um, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but if you have questions, you certainly can post them in the chat and I'm okay with you interrupting me to ask a question as we go through it as well. So thank you, thank you for being here. I can't see everyone who's on there, but but I do appreciate you being here. So let me uh, share my screen. Move it over. And if you cannot see all of the screen, you might try moving your row of, of, um, of our faces of the people on the, um, on the sidebar. So we're, what we're talking about today is connecting with the ancient energies of the temples, the land, 
the, the gods and the goddesses that the Egyptians called the Neferu. So go with me now and you might think about the 2024 tour that's coming up as we do this. Seeing pictures of the sacred sites can, can spark an energetic response. Now, pictures are not the same as being with the land or touching the water or putting your hands in the soil. However, pictures can help us open as well. This particular picture I, I find is very interesting. I don't know if that's an orb or a light that flashed from the camera, but there's another one down here. And this is a father and his two daughters who were on the side of um, the, um, the pyramid. And I thought it was such an incredible picture. And later I found these two things that are possibly orbs. So these are the kind of magical things that happen as you come to Egypt. The sacred temples and the other sacred sites actually are representations of the cosmos. They're like an architectural microcosm of the universe. The original temples were constructed according to this calculation with the stars and the earth. And so the temples were built in a particular way. They hold a mirror so that we can see ourselves in the cosmos if we open to that energy from the temples. Ooh, and there is a vastness that is just beyond compare. As you can see, the height of the people compared to these columns and statues, it's pretty amazing. So feel the vastness of the temples and the messages in the hieroglyphs and use that energy to align with the cosmic vortex. Now, a vortex is a spiral pull. It's, it's created by geomagnetic forces and it transfers this cosmic energy and moves and moves and moves to keep, in part, to keep the earth in balance. It's a swirling form, usually located where energy grid lines cross or in response to particular land formations. They flow clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on, on the vortex, but they tend, regardless of direction, they tend to gather and to clear what we call positive ions because what we want in our environment are negative ions. They are uplifting and enriching for us. And so these, these vortexes tend to clear those unwanted ions that accumulate on people. Egypt is one of those vortexes. The entire country, the land of Egypt, is a giant vortex. And many times on arriving in Egypt, it feels like you're in chaos. And it's because the energy is so different from what you may be accustomed to, to feeling and noticing. The very land, the soil, the water helps us move more easily to opening our chakra centers and aligning with our soul's purpose. And so I ask you today, are you ready to step into the vortex of your soul's purpose? Attuning to the, the vortex of the cosmic resonance in Egypt can really awaken your connection to ancient initiations. It awakens tones within your body that can harmonize your healing. A spiritual journey in Egypt can help awaken and activate the ascension of the chakras in your physical body as well as your emotional memory. The Nile River is the backbone and the chakra system of Egypt. Temples were constructed according to the human chakras with the Nile running between these sacred places. And within the temples, there are thousands of spots to connect with that divine energy. The crown chakra 
is said to be at Heliopolis. This is uh, near the pyramids, but not quite at the pyramids. It's one of the most ancient Egyptian cities where the sun god was the center of ancient Egyptian worship. When I call the directions, I called in Ra, sometimes called Amun-Ra, and Mut, his counterpart. They created the earth and the rivers from the chaos, the swirling nun, N-U-N, is what the Egyptians called it. And they brought the nun into, in, out of the chaos into the creation of the earth. The pyramids connect to both the crown and the brow chakras. The ancient ones, who were definitely aware of the chakras and the cosmic connection, mapped the stars. They built these geometric resonant temples and pyramids in stone circles. They aligned with the earth and the cosmos to connect with the divine. And there's the Great Sphinx, which is located there in Giza, near the largest of, of the pyramids. The Sphinx has a lion's body and a human head, and it symbolizes strength and intelligence. So while the pyramids are associated with both the crown and the brow, the Great Sphinx, which is our spiritual guardian, activates our brow center. The Sphinx is the third eye of the goddess who protects the Milky Way, and the Nile River reflects the Milky Way. The brow of that great sphinx, see that flow of energy coming from the brow. That connects to our physical pituitary and pineal glands. And when we connect with the sphinx, the sphinx through our brow center, it can help open the door to an enhanced level of intuition and can help awaken our perceptions. The crown and the brow centers open when we connect with those pyramids. Now, these are the three that are so easily recognizable. There are actually seven in this general area, but there are more than 100 pyramids in this, this northern part of Egypt, uh, mostly on the west bank of the Nile. So this is a picture of, of one of the tours of folks making our way to the entrance to the Great Pyramid. And this is actually a photograph of walking through the tunnels in the pyramid. It's much steeper than it looks. These boards are there to keep your feet from sliding backwards as you climb upward, getting into the upper chambers. And inside the Great Pyramid, inside any of the, the pyramids, it's an opportunity to open our brow and our crown chakra. There are many other pyramids um, south of Giza, where the prime, you know, those those major ones are located. Um, is the oldest of the pyramids. This was the first building of the pyramid. It's called the Step Pyramid, and it is still considered the the oldest colossal stone building in Egypt. And near there in Dashar is the Red Pyramid. This is one of the groups uh, in a circle of silence before entering the pyramid. And inside the pyramid, we were able to have um, meditative time. And again, um, taking a photograph and turning back, there are many little spots here. Many people call them orbs, and actually if you enlarge these as large as they will go, there's actually a geometric shape within each of these amazing orbs or whatever they are. And not all of our tours are at sacred sites. This is a part of our 2023 group going to dinner 
and entertainment on a, uh, a boat in the Nile where we had live music. We saw a belly dancer. Several of the members of our group, you know, danced a little along with the uh, belly dancer. And we also were able to see the tandoora dancing. You may um, be familiar with the term, the whirling dervishes that Rumi uh, started. In Egypt, they're not called whirling dervishes, they're called the tandoora dancers. And it was a pretty amazing event. And moving south of Giza, um, we find Abydos. Now this is probably the oldest ancient site in Egypt. This particular building uh, was built on top of even older structures, though this is several thousand years old. This particular land site was the pilgrimage center for the worship of Osiris, and it's very strongly associated with entrance into the afterlife. Abydos is connected to the throat center, and Majub that I quoted earlier said, sounds made in Abydos vibrate with a clear voice out to flow outward to help the darkness in anyone, to help clear the darkness, to help lighten, to help rise above depression or sadness or difficulty. Ah, and off we go to the ancient and modern city. Today it's called Luxor, and it's known as the heart chakra of Egypt. So here's the Nile River. This was taken from a hot air balloon. This is the Nile River, and this is sunrise. Luxor, which was once called Thebes, was the capital city for about 3,000 years. And it today is still Egypt's most abundant archaeological site. It is a, an extremely rich and, and incredible place. And being the heart chakra of Egypt, we, uh, my partner and I chose to have, build our spiritual center in Luxor. This is on the west bank of Luxor. And this is literally a picture of the front of our house, our spiritual center. It's painted to look like Hathor's temple at Dendara. And on the front door is a, a carving of Amun-Ra. And we call our center the House of Hathor. We use this center when our tours are in Luxor and we do um, our seminars in this location. And in Luxor, on the East Bank, is Karnak Temple. Now, all, when we say temple, usually we think of a single structure. But when we talk about the temples in Egypt, we're talking about a temple complex that was built over thousands of years by a variety of different pharaohs. So within Karnak Temple, there, there is the Temple of Amon, the Temple of Mut, Temple of Consul, the Temple of Sekhmet, and many others in addition to that. And these are just a few of the, of the, the incredible columns that are there. Uh, Hatshepsut, who was probably the most famous female pharaoh, created uh, and had, had erected four obelisks. This is only one that you can see in the picture. But I had this particular shot because right through this section, as you walk through Karnak Temple, at sunset at summer solstice and sunrise at winter solstice shines directly through this particular column right in through this area. Throughout Karnak Temple, there are lots of carvings and statues of Sekhmet. This is, this is Sekhmet. Um, she is the protector lion goddess. She's also called a dark goddess. She's a warrior, a protector of women and children, and many other things. There are more statues of Sekhmet guarding temples than any other Egyptian goddess. And 
almost all of the protector goddesses or protector of the god goddess line in Egypt are female, are the divine feminine. But the most amazing thing to me in regard to Sekhmet at Karnak is this very beautiful small temple dedicated to Sekhmet and we were able to go inside and spend a few minutes with this statue. There is no light and as you can see the pictures a little the color is not so good because there's no light inside this temple. And also at Karnak is the Kepper Scarab. Right here is the Scarab on top of this post and it's regarded as the good luck charm in Egypt. Pilgrims walk around it, you go around it stating you, to yourself your intention as you circle this and the ancient Egyptians believed that the scarab was this earthly manifestation of Kepri. And Kepri pushed the sun across the sky. Newt gave birth to the sun. Kepri pushed the sun across the sky. And Newt received the sun at sunset and held it in her body. This, the, the pure example of life birth, death, rebirth. Ah, between Karnak Temple and Luxor Temple, there are three miles of rows of sphinxes. Now these are much, much smaller than the Great Sphinx. Still pretty large, um, but nothing the size of the Great Sphinx. These at the bottom uh, are human-headed sphinxes. This is Hatshepsut's head. These are um, others down the line have Hathor's head, the cow head, and others, different pharaohs have different symbols and they each put their, their either their physical head or their symbol on the top of these sphinxes that go for several miles between the uh, Luxor Temple and Karnak Temples. Luxor Temple is no tiny place either, as you can see from, again from the size of the people to the statues. And the unique thing about Luxor Temple is that, like many places in Egypt, much of it was hidden under the sand. The Sphinx was even hidden under the sand for quite a few years and was eventually found and, and brought out. But 800 years ago, this mosque, Abu el Hag Mag Mosque, was, was built. And it actually was built on the wall of one of the temples within the Luxor Temple complex. But they didn't realize that they were building it on top of Luxor Temple until much later. Because this wall, which is part of Luxor Temple, was hidden under the sand. And so they built this incredible, beautiful mosque right on top of it. To me, that is the perfect example of the sacred and the mundane. Not that Luxor Temple was the mundane, but to the um, Islamic tradition where they were building a mosque, it was a mundane, the, the temple would have been considered a mundane place. And this picture taken in the, the evening, there's a McDonald's sign <laughs> and, and the temple so it brings that up. And right across the street from the temple is uh, a souk, one of the, the, the largest in Luxor. Uh, and within that is a, a famous a cafe that is dedicated to a famous Egyptian sing singer, Om Khatoum, and it's called Om Khatoum Cafe. Um, as we go back across the river, still in Luxor, but on the West Bank, there, there are many, um, there are tombs and temples and many, 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 many more things in Luxor. This is a picture of Habu Temple Complex, and there is Sekhmet guarding the temple entrance. Uh, the origins of Habu date back 4,000 years. 
um, from the original construction and later added on and built by Shepsut and Tutmos and, and other pharaohs along the way. The thing, one of the uh, things that I think is very um, beautiful about this particular temple is that during a time of war, when Ramses III was, was fighting lots and lots of people and Egypt was at war, this particular temple became the protective center for the women's village. The, the nobles and the workers of the women's village moved within this temple and stayed within there for many years during the war time. And another thing, just outside of Luxor, uh, a little bit out in the desert, is a Coptic church and monastery that's held sacred because this is a, a place, I mean, the, the, the church was not built at the time that, that baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph went to Egypt, but this is a place where legend says that they stopped that they stayed for many weeks in this area and later the monastery was built in this location and one of the trips when I was there the nuns told us one of the nuns told us the story um, that has been passed down from one generation to to another this is not a um, on a tourist site at all in fact they don't allow tourists to go into this because it is a monastery, but we were allowed to go in and, um, and walk around and see the beautiful sights. The day uh, that our 2023 tour was there, there was not a nun who spoke English, so we were not able to listen to the nun stories, but on a previous trip, I was able to hear the nun tell the story. Ah, and then we took uh, a felucca, one of these kinds of boats with sails on the Nile at sunset. And before sunset, well, a few of us jumped out of the boat and into the Nile. Uh, there were actually quite a few more than just these four. <laughs> this is my daughter and me. This is Debbie, who's on the call with us today, and another person from the group. There were quite a few of us who were in the water that day, so we did get our feet and our hands into the Nile. Ah, and this is uh, a little fun and dance with belly dancing, which is very famous in Egypt. And our, one of our last stops in Luxor is at the Valley of the Queens. Now Hatshepsut was the very famous female pharaoh. This is her, the temple that was built in her honor, built right into the wall of the mountain behind her and this is one of our groups um, this is a 2018 um, tour where we were in a circle of silence at the temple Hatshepsut is known for working with Sashet the goddess of astronomy because all of Hatshepsut's temples everything that she had built were aligned with the stars to harmonize with that divine energy. And as we move along the Nile from Luxor, the heart chakra center, we move toward the solar plexus center. And at the solar plexus, we encounter two different temples where we find the merging of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. I find this very interesting because if you look at the chakra system, chakra of seven, um, that's the major chakras in our system, the center chakra is the solar plexus. And this is the center that's regarded as the blending of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. So Dendara, the temple of Hathor, is, is not close by. It's in another location uh, closer to Luxor but we're headed toward Edfu, the temple of Horus. And so the story is about Hathor and Horus. So we stand at, at the temple in Dendara, Hathor's temple, 
we stand in that vibration because that temple again are portals a way of connecting us to the energy there are many many legends about Hathor now what you have to remember is that we're talking about thousands thousands of years of, of stories some that were written but every with changes over time from the new kingdom to the middle kingdom from the old kingdom to the middle to the new the storylines changed and many of the stories of Hathor are the same stories that we hear today of Isis and and other many other uh, legends change across time so Hathor is regarded as a wife of Horus now this may be referring to Horus the elder uh, she's also regarded sometimes as the mother of Horus except our storyline tells us that Isis is the mother and that Hathor was the caregiver to keep uh, Horus safe so at any rate however the storylines go Hathor and um, as we go to the Hathor temple the priests and priestesses took prayers and requests of the people and so our prayers and our requests flow from us into the temple and the guidance and the grace flow from us it's not just pouring it out to say hey God help me out here this is letting it flow from the divine into us through us and flow outward and Hathor's priestesses let that energy flow they sailed up the river I'm sorry they would sail down the river to the south um, to meet at at the uh, Edfu temple which was Horus's temple so Hathor and her priestesses would travel for these um, uh, elaborate celebrations and feasts for this joining of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. Edfu was the temple of Horus and it and Dendara are the solar plexus chakra blending there. Edfu temple was created for alchemical healing, created for peace and alignment and connection. And moving on further south is Kamambo, another temple on the river. Kamambo vibrates with the sacral chakra. The sacral indicating creativity, emotions, sexuality. And the creative aspect of this temple is that it was dedicated to not one but two gods, built so that one side was dedicated to Sobek and the other to Horus. And this is important because this reflects the duality in the ancient Egyptian religion, where gods had multiple aspects and multiple forms. Horus is depicted as a falcon, and here is one of uh, the carvings in the temple of Horus with Isis uh, guiding him from behind him. And Sobek is the crocodile god again with Isis supporting him, the two entrances uh, of the temple. And so as we go along the Nile, we continue to move south and we come to Aswan. Of course, we stop for afternoon tea by the river and we go to the temple of Philae. This was built to honor Isis. And Philae Temple calls us to ground ourselves as we connect to our root chakra. Isis calls us to stand with the lineage of enlightened guardians and guides. Isis calls us to allow the guides to support us to manifest our creative, bold, and enlightened self. Isis calls us to let our inner voice speak, speak loudly, not as the quiet, tentative voice drowned out by our daily thoughts, by our daily lives as a human, but let our inner voice 
lead us as we stand up, as Ma'at calls us to be warriors of the heart, that we open to our heart center and let that voice speak through our throat chakra with the strength and the power from our root chakra. Isis calls us to her temple, just as she called Nefertari. Nefertari was a very famous and highly recognized, highly honored Egyptian queen, and she was a priestess of Isis. In this picture, she's wearing the crown of the sacred vulture. And Isis, a mother goddess and teacher for the pharaohs and rulers of all people, protected and taught and guided Nefertari. And she said to Nefertari, this is a famous carving on the temple wall, Isis says to Nefertari, come Nefertari, beloved of the goddess, that I may show you your place in the sacred world. What would your world be like today if you knew from childhood that you were considered the beloved of the divine goddess? So whether you knew it from childhood or not, right now, Feel that love of Isis and ancient Egypt surround you. Let her wings, right this moment, fold around, wrap around you, coming to hold you. Let her love surround you. Let the love of the great God mother goddess surround you, and as Nefertari did, let Isis take your hand. Open your heart and let the love flow in. The ancient Egyptians came 36 to possibly 40,000 years ago as recorded on temple walls and in ancient writings. The ancient Egyptians call us to remember our interconnectedness with all living beings, to honor every element, fire, earth, air, and water. Let the energy of the land and the tones of Egypt awaken you. So thank you for coming today. We will have a, uh, another tour to Egypt in November 2024, led by my daughter, Truth Wingfield, and me and our uh, Egyptian counterparts, Majub and Off. And uh, if you're interested in that, please send me an email, and uh, we can do a, a phone call or a Zoom call to talk more about it. But let me uh, stop sharing the screen and come back to the um, to the gallery view here and see. Oh, there's Paula. Hi. <laughs> and see if anyone has any questions or any comments that you'd like to talk about here. Oh, I see several people I didn't see before. Yes, welcome everyone. Yes, if you have a question or a comment, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Anybody? Hi. Um, this beautiful slideshow is so inspiring. I can't believe it. Um, how is traveling in Egypt right now? Oh, um, that's a good question. It, it actually was really fine. It was wonderful. We were there. Um, our, our 2023 tour was there in October. Um, and, uh, in, you know, after or during the... Um, the time that the Israeli conflict started with the Palestinians. And uh, we, were, we were in Cairo, we were in Luxor, we had absolutely 
nothing that her there wasn't even an increased level of security uh, in Egypt or at the airports or anything at all. Um, now, Israel uh, does border Egypt, but it's in the far north uh, eastern corner in the mountains. And it's, it's not even close to where the Nile River is, where uh, tourism uh, mm -hmm. occurs. I mean, um, so we, we really, it was very safe and, and very easy for us to travel. Yeah, there is a tremendous um, um, connectedness among all of the Egyptian guides in Egypt. And if anything is happening, the guides through their network are in touch with one another. So no, no tour group is, is surprised by something uh, because anything that's going on, the guides let each other know. So we were, we were quite safe. Yeah. Thank you. I just am so inspired by this, by your knowledge of Egypt and the slideshow. It's just beautiful. Can't wait to learn more. Oh, thank you. Maybe thank accompany you. you next to in the in the fall. Ah, well, send me an email and we can talk a little about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Any comments? I have Thoughts? a question. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I have two questions. Um, so I know how things things change too, and we're a full year out. So likely things will probably change, but you were showing a lot of the temples that were farther south than what we did this year. Mm -hmm. Are those to be included? Is that what you're thinking of in 2020? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. we, we will start in Cairo and, and go up our, go, it would be, <laughs> I get up and down backwards because the, the Nile River runs north. So we will follow south um, uh, on the Nile to Aswan, yes. Okay. And then I, I know that Off was talking a little bit about maybe adding some hot springs or the white de desert or the black, whatever those are, the black desert, the white desert, maybe he was, what are those thoughts at this point? Um, those would be an add-on, not a part of the basic okay. tour. Yeah. There mm -hmm. is okay. so much to see in Egypt. I mean, I, I, there are many places I've never been, and I've been to Egypt a lot of times. Um, it, it's just, it, it, the, the places are endless. What we try to do, and what we did on this last tour, was really try to build in a lot of, uh, as much as possible, with seminars to process what was going on. Um, this tour will move a little faster because we'll, we won't stay as long in each location as we did in 2023. But um, we still will only just really hit the highlights, not not all of the uh, things. And and you may not on the 2024 tour, you may not see everything that you saw in these slides either. We we won't necessarily go to all of those. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other comments? Questions? Hi, Peggy. This is Lynn. I want to ask her, is, going, is that tour going to the Red Pyramid again? Yes, we, we will definitely go to the Red Pyramid again. Yes, okay. I went inside it. I just wanted to tell people that it was a little hard getting up to the entrance, but once you did, it wasn't so bad going inside. It's, yeah, it's, you go down backwards, and it was really so amazing to be inside the Red Pyramid. Yes, it was pretty, it was pretty astounding. <laughs> Yeah. Debbie. Uh, something I think is, is pretty marvelous is to be able to see. Uh, there are five of us on this call that went with you this past October. And Susan over there, it says iPhone Susan, wave Susan, <laughs> was my roommate for part of the tour in 20, 2020, January of 2020. So you know, I, I can tell that the the love and the excitement and the energy is still reaching out and touching each one of us. And and I really hope that those of you on the call um, who are, you know, coming to see and you're interested, that um, you follow your heart. Yeah. 
thank you, Peggy. It reminds me uh, good uh, good places. <laughs> mm -hmm. We were Teresa and I were uh, in Egypt on tour in 2018, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Good to see you. Yeah. Yes, it's good for me too. Anyone else? Any other comments, questions? Peggy, I'm curious about, um, this is Anne here. Um, uh -huh. I'm curious about how you came up, uh, how you, you define the chakras and assign chakras to these different locations. Is that general knowledge? Has that been known for a long, long time? Or is this something that you've kind of assessed? No, it's it's not from from me. Um, this this came. I, I I wouldn't say that it's general knowledge that it's knowledge known by everyone, but this is knowledge that's known by um, spiritual teachers in Egypt, Egyptian Egyptian teachers, and it was taught to me by one of our spiritual Egyptian guides. Okay. <clears throat> I always find that quite insightful, you know, like the Hawaiian Islands, you know, they, uh -huh. they kind of assign different chakras to the Hawaiian Islands, you know, based on just the culture and the energy, like you said. So I, I find that interesting. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I, and you... I, didn't, I didn't write down, I, I wish I'd written down the chakras for each place. Do you have that written anywhere? Um, no, but this will be recorded, and so you can go okay. back through the recording and take a look at it. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, I find that interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have another question. Yeah, that um, just popped in my mind. In, I'm curious. In, in Egypt, in Egyptian culture these days, or in society these days, is there a strong um, or a sizable um, sort of um, current of people who are studying who worshiping along these lines like the ancient egyptian um goddess worship or spirituality is uh, ancient egyptian spirituality alive and well in egypt these in, in current society i guess that's the way to ask the question yeah that that's a good question i have a uh, a good friend who uh, has an egyptian mystery school he is egyptian but he's been in the united states for 30 40 years or more um and he would say absolutely not but um but i think what i i would say to that and i think my egyptian partner would say to that is that the ancient egyptian um religion i don't it's not that's not really the right word for it but the ancient egyptian spiritual beliefs are alive and well in the people in Egypt. Wow. Now, the majority of Egyptians by religion are Islamic, though there are Christians, Coptic Christians, there are Hindus, there are Buddhists, I mean, there are people across religions. Um, but what I see in Egypt is people, everyday, ordinary folks who really read energy, mm. feel the energy, who are very intuitive, much, much, much more than any group of people I've ever come in contact with in other places. Wow. So they don't worship the gods and the goddesses at all, but the, the resonance from the ancient Egyptian teachings are still there within the land and within the people. It's like it's in the air, it's in the water, it's in the elements, and they just they they absorb it. They're just part of it, even though, yeah, yes. it, superficially they're they're Muslim or they're yes. that's so interesting. Yes. And so they're maybe the study, the actual explicit study of um, ancient history schools or ancient Egyptian history schools is elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But um, in Egypt it's just more um, I don't know what would be the world just word uh, just in the bio just in the in the field can't yeah. be missed or something in the DNA <laughs> in the DNA yeah yeah interesting mm, thank you yeah any other comments questions 
a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, will you be going to the new museum where Tutankhamun's uh, artifacts are? Have you been going to that, or is that? Maybe, maybe not. We, okay. <laughs> we were not able to go in 2023. Apparently, it is open very limited times, not necessarily every day. It's not fully open. And okay. so um, we went to the old museum and the um, the King King Tut is still, all, all of those uh, artifacts are still in the old museum. And we did go there and, um, you know, there was a lot to see in the old museum. It was a fraction of what was there that I had seen in the past because so much of it has been moved to the new one. But um, yeah, we will go to the new one if it, if they allow us. And uh, if not, we'll go to the old one. <laughs> well, I was wondering about that because I was there in 2018. We saw we were in the old museum and I wondered that they were going to just kind of abandon that and repurpose it. And everything was going to be in that new museum. So I've yeah. been waiting to go back and see all that together. But yeah. I, I think Worth seeing anyway because it's so old. I mean, it's an antique museum. It's beautiful. It is. It's quite beautiful. Yeah. Where, where do you stay in Cairo then when you're in Cairo? Um, well, we stayed at a, um, uh, a place that was where we were. I don't know that you can see this picture behind me, but uh, yeah, it's not large enough to really see. But um, we were on the, the deck of the place where we stayed, looking out at the, uh, at the pyramids. And, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And we do stay at, um, we, we try to stay at places that are locally owned, not major conglomerates that are owned with places all over the world, but Egyptian owned. Um, Hotels and restaurants. We we try everything that we do. We try to to um, connect that to to locally owned businesses as much as yeah. possible. Who owns the Mena House now? Again, when I was there, that was in transition. The Mena House at, at Giza. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. It's, kind of, it's getting kind of run down, but <laughs> it's so old. Yeah. We find to you know mingle with the people more. I think. Mm. Yeah. The locals and you know rather than this market. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Nice pictures you had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um.